Hey everyone, welcome. My name is Rainus. I am a software engineer on the platform infrastructure team at Affirm. Uh, and in this session, I'll be talking about where we went wrong in building a self-service platform on Kubernetes. For those of you who don't know, Affirm is a buy now, pay later service. And if any of my coworkers are watching this, no, this doesn't mean that I think um, we did a lot of things wrong in our platform. In fact, I think we did a lot of things right. Um, but I do think the most interesting uh, lessons are taken from where we went wrong. So with that, um, first I'll be talking about a little bit of background and give some context on what our infrastructure looks like before Kubernetes. Then I'll talk about some of the principles that we focus on when building out our self-service platform on Kubernetes and what that platform looked like. Next, I'll be touching on the problems that we solved as well as the problems we created. And finally, what we're all here for, which is the lessons and the takeaways and what we can uh, take from that in developing our future platforms or iterating on our current platform. So a little bit of context. Obviously, this is a very simplified model of what our infrastructure looked like, but we run a lot of our infrastructure on AWS and we were using EC2 instances to run our services. And um, these EC2 instances were grouped by AWS auto scaling groups. We were also running salt stack to configure all of our EC2 instances. Um, and so we'd create salt states um, that then we would um, push to the rest of the EC2 instances to actually configure them. There might be a few issues that could come from this model, but for the purposes of this, I just want to focus on a few. The first is that uh, creating a new service could take months. If an application developer wanted to create a new service, they would create an infrastructure ticket and then an infra engineer would get assigned to that ticket. And alongside their other work, they would work to spin up that infrastructure. This could include spinning up load balancers, setting up target groups, security groups, the EC2 instances and the ASGs, creating new salt states, then running those salt states. There was a lot of work involved in um, setting up a service and a lot of back and forth between the application developer and the infra engineer. And this could take months. Uh, obviously, nobody wants that um, and neither party was happy with that. Another issue we, we had was that scaling was slow and manual and required the infra team to go in, um, learn about each service, and then set the desired replicas for each service. This is a lot of work and required a lot of uh, a lot of the infrastructure team to learn about the specifics of how each application run to determine what the scale needed to be. And then finally, I alluded to this before, but doing anything required going through infra, even something as simple as viewing your machine logs required submitting a ticket, um, waiting for an infra engineer to then send back a file with the logs that you were interested in. So with Kubernetes, there are a few guiding principles that we thought about. Uh, one is that we wanted everything to be self-service. We wanted people to be able to do everything on their own. We didn't want infrastructure to be a bottleneck. We also wanted them to have the autonomy to change their service as they saw fit. We wanted them to be able to configure and figure their service in different ways, have the flexibility to set up or change their infrastructure, or tweak certain things, depending on the needs of their particular service. And then with these two things, with self-service and autonomy, we knew we had to implement plenty of guardrails. We wanted to make sure that no one service could impact the other and that no application developer um, could either advertently or inadvertently affect some other service. So with self-service, um, the first principle, one of the things that we did uh, to work on that was we created templates. So we knew that for each particular service, there were a bunch of Kubernetes files that would define that service from the deployment, from a horizontal pod autoscaler um, to pod disruption budgets, etc. And so we created templates for those resources. And then the application developer would fill out a configuration file with a bunch of input fields. And then we would take the configuration file, those inputs, along with the templates, 
uh, we would use mustache and customize to then create the final Kubernetes manifest. And then those manifests would be the ones that we would be applied. So with this, um, we allowed uh, application developers to just fill out uh, basically a bunch of input fields, pass that onto our templates, and then create Kubernetes manifests. We also, as I mentioned, wanted to give um, application developers autonomy. Um, so two ways that we did this was, I mentioned this before, defining the inputs uh, to those templates, but we also gave them the, the ability to add their own custom Kubernetes uh, manifest. So if they needed um, some other service or some other way of defining the deployment that was different than what we had, um, they could do so and they could just add their own Kubernetes resources. We also created uh, certain custom uh, controllers. So one example of this is we created an AWS IAM controller. This was before um, AWS had its uh, its own ACK controllers. Um, and this controller allowed service owners to define the access needed for their service, and it would create the corresponding IAM role. So we were trying to automate any of the creation of external resources. And then finally, we set up some guard rails. And some examples of this include using Open Policy Agent Gatekeeper um, to restrict a bunch of things or validate things. So we were restricting image repositories. Um, we were preventing collisions of uh, URIs of different public services so that each service could define their own public URIs without uh, colliding with any others um, and keeping those unique. We were validating configs or fields in the horizontal pod autoscalers against pod disruption budgets um, and, and more. We were also obviously using Kubernetes RBAC, and we also created a custom controller per namespace that would add resource quotas, create role bindings from a teams list, and kind of set up a bunch of other uh, limits and configurations that we felt was necessary. So obviously we solved some problems, um, but with any new system, we're also creating new problems. Um, so some of the things that went well is we were uh, using industry standard tools to provide guardrails, um, and we're doing a pretty good job of making sure that no service was impacting any other service. Um, we also were automating the creation of external resources um, uh, you can recall the AWS IAM controller that I mentioned. Um, that's just one example of us trying to automate the creation of external resources so that application developers could work within Kubernetes um, and didn't have to go into the AWS console, didn't have to go into any of, the, of our other infrastructure um, knobs to turn those. They could just have, they would just had one place, one platform where they could um, change or create resources. And then users of the platform also had the freedom to customize their application as they desired. There were a lot of input fields that they could modify, um, but in addition to that, they could also just create their own Kubernetes resources if the templates that we had built did not work for their use cases. So all of that was great, um, but uh, our platform actually didn't end up being built for the most common customer. Um, obviously, our customer here is the application developer. Um, and when thinking about what our common customer was, it was a product engineer whose priority is shipping new features. Um, and they want to ship features as quickly as possible, as easily as possible. They're not necessarily worried about the infrastructure that those features um, are running on. Of course, there are always exceptions and for certain things, some of that is required. You have to think about that performance. But the reality of our situation was that um, the majority of uh, product engineers wanted to focus on the shipping new features. And our common customer, customer was also someone who didn't have much of a Kubernetes background. Um, you know, in fact, most, most of the company didn't have a Kubernetes background um, and we were all learning as we went. Um, but this uh, was something that we didn't fully, um, fully appreciate or think about uh, when we were designing the platform. So some of the problems. One, there were too many knobs to turn for this common customer. Um, most people who used it didn't 
want to change all of the input fields. Um, some of them didn't even know what to uh, what to set as some of the input fields. Um, so that really became an issue for us. Our platform also required use of, uh, of Kubernetes and it required some Kubernetes knowledge. So at first we actually uh, were doing a lot of work to try to educate people on Kubernetes. And we thought, you know, this is the way forward. People should learn the ins and outs of our platform, not just how to use it, but they should learn um, what it's running on. They should learn Kubernetes. And we created videos. We had a lot of documentation. We held office hours. We did a lot to try to spread this knowledge. Um, but the fact of the matter is, was that our co common customer didn't have this knowledge to begin with. And we were also giving them too much autonomy. Uh, most people actually didn't want to change all of those fields. Uh, they wanted something that was easy to set up and so that they could quickly build new features. So with that, some of the takeaways. Um, well, one of the things that uh, we learned from this experience is uh, building a shallow interface. So what do I mean by that? I mean that users should be able to get started as quickly as possible. We need, to, we need to provide defaults everywhere so that a user doesn't need to set all of these inputs um, in order to just get started. Um, if we want, they can then change that later. But to start off with, there should be defaults for everything. And users should be able to start small, but then go more complex as desired. So with this last point of starting small and then going more complex, you might be thinking, okay, well, you're kind of telling me to just do both. Keep it simple, but also giving them flexibility. It seems like it's a hard thing to achieve. So how do we achieve this balance of um, having something that's simple, that's easy to get started, that's not a burden for the customer and that provides standardization, but also gives them some flexibility, some finer grained control and allows you know, users with more complex use cases to also um, take advantage of the platform. Um, my approach to this is to provide a shallow interface, uh, but then give a, sh a shovel for the rest. Um, so what, what does that mean? That means that the simpler approach is gonna work for most of the cases. And in our case, that was probably over 80% of the cases really just needed the simpler approach. Um, and so they just needed the shallow interface, but we still need to provide some sort of escape hatch for other users who need, um, you know, who have that special use case or who want to um, have finer grained control over the infrastructure of their service. Essentially, this is because people who want the flexibility will figure out a way to get it. Um, so the main thing was building for those 80% of the use cases and simply having an escape hatch. Um, for us, there was no need to um, build out all of these features for those complex use cases. Um, that was something that we could work directly with the people that had the more complex use cases. And honestly, the people who do have those cases are also the people that are more likely to go under the hood and learn the intricacies of the platform and are able to contribute to the platform to make those use cases possible. Um, so um, with that, that's how we were aiming to build a shallow interface, but still providing a shovel for the rest. And that's it. Uh, thanks so much for listening and uh, reach out to me if you have any other further questions and hope you enjoy the rest of the conference.